Studios. This is Sporting Journal Radio. <laughs> Presented by On X. Know where you stand with On X. That's a new personal best bike here. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, wherever, or just streaming it on demand at sportingjournalradio.com. Thank you very much. With us, as always, Dan Amundsen, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, how's that's, it going? How's it going, that's Dan? That's a weird camera angle. <laughs> well, <that's Hey>. right. <laughs> well, I'll talk for a minute while you fix that camera over there. Our camera guy's got the day off today, apparently. Well... Dan's actually, I think you turned the camera off. Dan's actually the camera. Which you guy. shouldn't have. <laughs> it's probably Don't my, touch my camera. Probably my fault. There's no doubt about it. Well, in any case, we got a great show for you this week. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Bredigan is going to be with us. He's going to be talking about early Canada goose season. So that's kicking off uh, in the Dakotas, and all the hunting seasons are going to start opening up. And uh, Ben and we, we've all spent a lot of time in North Dakota chasing geese around. What's it going to be like this year? Could be a little tough. We'll find out. We'll talk to Ben, though, about some tips on how your Canada goose season in the early season will go better. Some scouting tips and how Onyx can help you along the way. We'll talk upland uh, hunting just a little bit, too. And uh, we'll get into fishing. Of course, they caught some massive fish up at Lake of the Woods this last week, including a 34-inch walleye. We'll show you that picture if you're watching this what? video. Yeah, big, big fish. The The Warrior Boats tournament, the David Anderson tournament took place up there, and what was the winning bag, Dan? It was almost 49 pounds. Let's see. <laughs> oh, look at that camera. 49 hey, pounds. Look at that. Five yeah. fish. Yeah, you're almost in focus even, too. Look at that. It's close. <laughs> yeah huge huge fish up there we're going to find out how they caught those fish and uh, how fishing has been and what you have to do to go find big fish at lake of the woods right now plus eric osberg went out with his son and they couldn't catch fish they were marking fish they found them they dropped the camera down saw some fish and uh did what they could to finally start catching them and they figured out a pattern they figured out a way to do it what was that he will tell us here in just a little bit. Plus, we got a really interesting story from something that we filmed this week for Prairie Sports, and we'll tell you about that in just a second. But first, Dan, who are the sponsors this week? Yeah, Haybill Heights Campground and Resort. Book a trip for this summer or winter at haybillheights.com. Ottertail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital. Plan a trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Camp Grayling will be headed there soon. Catch the Grand Slam, Lake Trout, Pike Grayling, and Walleye Fish Camp Grayling this summer. On X, Nori Stand with On X. Mid Migration Outfitters, come hunt waterfall out of heated 10 man pits and comfortable blinds. Learn more at midmigrationoutfitters.com. And Prairie Sports, when we're filming the new season uh, right now, but last season you can watch on the YouTube channel right now. That's whenever right. Whenever you want. PrairieSportsman.org is a website. It's got links to everything, the YouTube channel, or search for Prairie Sportsman on YouTube or on the Pioneer PBS website. Actually, any PBS website you can go to and watch any episode of Prairie Sportsman that you would like to watch. And get ready for the new season starting in January. Yesterday, uh, I was in... I was way over my waders on the Palm de Terre River, definitely filling up my waders. Thankfully, it's a pretty shallow river, and I was, I was kneeling down most of the time. That's why I kept filling up my waders, but... Uh, filming these guys in scuba gear, sometimes they're in three, yeah, real shallow water, uh, and they were searching for mussels, all right? And now you might be saying, why do I care about mussels? Why, why are you going to tell me about mussels? Well, mussels are fascinating to me. And uh, at one time, they're almost wiped out because button makers and pearl hunters were, were wiping them all out to make buttons and jewelry. Uh, but mussels are a sign of a healthy river. And this project on the Palm de Terre, they rerouted the Palm de Terre a couple of years ago. From, from all these guys that were in the river, they were talking about this being such a unique experience. And they don't know of any other project that's been done like this in the world or in the country. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it has. I don't know. They didn't know of one. And they, they were kind of experts on the subject. But uh, in the 1930s, the Marsh Lake Dam was built. It was a WPA project. And then a couple of years ago, they had a new ecosystem restoration project to draw down Marsh Lake, replace the old dam, put a new water control structure in, as well as a fish ladder. And to do all this, they had to reroute the Palm de Terre River. 
So it was rerouted back in the 1930s to go around to the top side of this old dam that they built. And when they replaced that dam, they rerouted it back to its original channel 80 years later. It is a remarkable project. We actually filmed a whole Prairie Sportsman episode about it that you can watch right now on YouTube. It is a $13 million uh, project. It was involved the Corps of Engineers, DNR, a lot of different agencies. So it's a pretty big undertaking. Well, they relocated some mussels in the part of the river that was going to be essentially eliminated. It was going to dead end. There'd be no flow there. They didn't want these mussels wiped out. We've got 51 mussels, I think, in Minnesota, Dan, and a number of them are listed as a, like a species of special concern because uh, they're, they're kind of getting wiped out. Mussels clean the water. And just the life cycle of them. This is the story I wanted to tell you about mussels. And this is what I think is kind of fascinating is they need fish, right? So that there's a, there's what's going on over there. There's a relationship between fish and mussels. That's pretty unique. So mussels have specific host fish that they need to, that they need to continue their life cycle. So uh, when mussels are, let's see, it's larvae or there's a word for it too, that it's glucordy. I'm not even sure. This is a scientific word that I'm just going to, I'm just going to call them larvae. But essentially they need a host fish. So they live, you know, they, they don't, they can't really move around too much. So they kind of live in one area and when they've reproduced, they're fertilized and then some of them even have little lures that look like little tiny fish that they wiggle and then the host fish comes to eat that other fish and when it does it the muscle will shoot their larvae into this fish and then the larvae attach to the fish uh like on their gills they don't hurt the fish at all and the fish swims around them a little bit and after x amount of time they drop off and disperse around the lake or river uh usually in the rivers and that's how they move around and it's, it's an amazing life cycle. And if they don't have uh, the right type of fish, some, some only work with specific fish, like the Mississippi River had a, had a, a mussel called a, where is it? Uh, I can't, I, oh, the ebony shell, the ebony shell and elephant ear mussel. They're, they are specific. Their host fish is a skipjack herring. Well, the Lock and Dam 19 on the Mississippi River in Iowa, when that was constructed, it blocked migration of the skipjack herring north uh, up the Mississippi River. And now those mussels are completely gone north of that Lock and Dam in the Mississippi River. So they need those specific fish to move around. So it's just, to me, it's just wild. And a lot of people, I didn't know the story of mussels and how they relate to fish and how basically they need to live in the gills of these fish when they're larvae to, uh, to, to continue their life cycle. Some don't, the juvenile mussels, they don't reproduce until they're, you know, uh, five, six, seven, eight years old. And some of them will live to be 70 or 80 years old. Like, uh, it, it's pretty amazing life cycle that these things have. So again, why should you care about them? Well, they filter oxygen and particles from the water, cleansing the water in the process and absorbing what they consume into their bodies and shells. Uh, they often spend their entire life in just a small area and they're real sensitive to changes in that environment. And that's why they relocated mussels from this area of the Palm de Terre River that we filmed. And what was really interesting is where we went and filmed this week it was a part of the river that basically was a new part of the river it was the old part and then we, when they rerouted it it became part of the river again so there were no mussels in it probably not much for fish if any and now there's mussels that have that have uh, shown up there that were never there so they're only four years old and that project was four years ago so it was an interesting uh, project to learn more about uh, that they showed up where they hadn't been before. So enough about mussels. You can learn more about them now on the Prey Sportsman YouTube channel. You can see the past episodes where we talk about mussels in this life cycle and that Marsh Lake, uh, Marsh Lake Ecosystem Restoration Project. Go to the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. While you're on YouTube, check out the per, uh, Sporting Journal Radio YouTube channel because we just put up a new video where we went bass fishing at Disney World. I didn't even know you could do this. But we were working iCast, and Dan and I were in the live Target booth. And these two guys came in that said Disney on their badges. And I was like, Disney? What do you guys do at Disney? And like, oh, we got bass fishing. I said, what? I said, yep. All right. 
take me out there on Saturday. So we went in a hundred degree, hundred degree heat along with Dina Vic right there, Dan and I, we jumped in this nitro 21 foot nitro and we went bass fishing at Disney world. Dan, didn't you, didn't we hear the train at one point while we were out oh, there? Yeah, you could hear all of magic kingdom. We we're literally right next to it. Let's see here. Look camera. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of blows my mind every time it works now. Uh, yeah, you could, I mean, we were at the Contemporary Hotel, basically in the Magic Kingdom. You could see Space Mountain, the castle, the whatever else is in that park. I can't remember. Ice cream cones and fairy tales, I and guess. Mulch. Malts. Oh, malts. Malts. Oh, yeah. Well, malts. It was cool. And we caught some nice bass. Apparently, there's some 10-pounders in there and uh, some big crappies and some catfish and some other stuff. Right next, we literally walked through the... Con Dan, there's video of Dan walking through the Contemporary Hotel underneath the monorail with fishing rods in his hand. It was kind of a surreal experience. And that's new video available now on the Sporting Journal Radio YouTube channel. Uh, check it out. Coming up, Ben Bredigan joins us to talk about early Canada goose hunting in North Dakota. We've got Joe Henry and Eric Osberg all on the way. Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Hay Bale Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. All right, it's getting to be that time of year, man. I mean, uh, I've had a good time this summer doing some fishing in some pretty cool places from Florida to Saskatchewan and, and even around home here in Minnesota too. But uh, I love fall. It's my favorite time of the year and it's time to start thinking about it just a little bit since you can hunt early geese in, uh, in North Dakota here uh, pretty quick. And uh, Saskatchewan, of course, we're going to be heading up there at the beginning of September. And you got everything, everything kicking off. Doves on September 1st and everything like that. So it's time to start talking about hunting. And Ben Bredigan from OnX is going to join us right now to get you prepared for the hunting season out there. But Ben, for, we, let's just one real quick thing. Have you been doing any fishing or has it been all dog training this summer for you? I've been doing a little bit of fishing. We got up to Lake of the Woods, um, been kind of fishing in the in the walker area a little bit leech etc um but now it's after it cre keeps creeping back every year but now i'm what after the fourth of july i'm done with it <laughs> it's, it's getting dogs ready it's getting ready to hunt so there's just so much to do well I'm, I'm fired up yeah i mean it gives a whole new meaning to dog days of summer right like it it can get fishing can get tough when you get into late july and august and uh it's nice to just start working the dogs i'm trying to get my dogs back into shape a little bit and over the uh after the off season and and get them ready for the hunting season and are you are you going to take part in any august hunting maybe uh you know chase some upland birds around somewhere else in a different place or uh, do some early canada goose or anything like that yeah, so I've got, uh, actually, I'll be out in Montana for doing some work stuff here for the next week or so, and then I get back for a few days, and I'm headed out um, kind of like the last week of August, back out to Montana to go get ready for, for uh, Sharpie and hunt season. So I'll I'll be out there running the dogs, kind of getting them in shape, letting them know what they're, you know, what they're supposed to do again, and, and then we'll kick it off September 1 and, and bring the shotguns out, so... So if you're going to have an outdoor, if you're going to start an outdoor company these days, do you have to headquarter it in Bozeman or is it, I mean, like, I, <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I always thought Minnesota is a pretty good outdoor state and I know we're not, you know, uh, not the biggest one out there or anything like that, but I feel like everybody's in Montana now. Man, it is. Uh, so we actually do have an office in Bozeman, but we're out of Missoula mm. technically. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's where all the hipsters go. You want to... <laughs> chew on bark and work for an outdoor company that's where you gotta go so well, and i I'm don't blame minnesota so yeah and i don't blame i mean montana is an incredible state for the outdoors like for mm -hmm. for hunting and and fishing for that matter like I, I don't blame people for going it's cool there's mountains and all that good stuff too so i don't blame people for going out there and it's nice to it's nice to go there for work ben yeah it is. <laughs> it's great to you know take a break go to the mountains but um no place like Minnesota. I still say it. I uh, I could do Eastern Montana, but yeah. out, to be honest, the mountains. You got to drive too far to go hunt anything. I mean, you could hunt some things, but Dude, I'm the same. Wide. 
Yeah, I'm the same way. Like people are always like, "Oh, it's why don't it's the mountains? It's beautiful. It's this and that." I'm like, "Yeah, it's great to look at. I don't want to drive through them in the winter. I don't really want to walk up one to, to hunt. Maybe if I'm elk hunting or something, but like I love the prairie. I I love mm-hmm. being able to see see a long ways and you know, when I, fa- I I always joke about grouse hunting, you know, like rough grouse hunting. Rough grouse, Meek is moving the cam. Meek is our new cameraman, apparently, <laughs> adjusting the camera over here. Get her the steady cam. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I always joke about rough grouse hunting versus pheasant hunting. And, you know, Dan and I have had this argument about living in the prairie versus living in the woods of northern Minnesota. And it's like, but I when I flush a bird, I like to see it. You know, I like to be able to see it and maybe have a second shot at it or, uh, you know, or especially early season grouse hunting. It's a lot of times. Oh, I heard one. I heard one. Yeah. When you start counting birds you heard <laughs> or not even have seen. Yeah. Rough grouse hunting is like musky fishing, right? Like, oh, we raised, we raised six fish today. Oh, we, we flushed six grouse today. We didn't see them. We didn't yeah. catch them. But, uh, but it was a good day. It was a good day. That, that is a good point. It, yeah, that, there's definitely a parallel there. It's like you got your flush counter. You don't – nobody asks like, oh, how many birds did you shoot? It's, oh, how many did you flush today? So, yeah. And this – and I, I want to say something. This isn't a knock on upland hunters or rough grouse hunters, but I, I feel like sometimes rough grouse hunters are more happy when they don't shoot one, when, <laughs> you know, when they just hear them or, or see them but, uh, but don't shoot one. Yeah, my great excuse is like, if I don't shoot one, it's like, oh, that was some great dog work there, <laughs> right? Oh, man, do it for the dogs. It's like sunset pictures. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's well, that's great. cool. So you're going you're gonna to go out to Montana. Um, what are you going to hunt? What are you going to hunt out there? Primarily sharp, sharp-tailed grouse sharpies. and huns. So sharpies and huns. Um, it should be, you know, all in North Dakota, Montana, uh, great moisture this spring. Um, the cover should be there. Grasshoppers are in in full force right now, so there's ample food for them. I've got high hopes. Uh, last year was still good, and we had kind of record drought. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm always optimistic, but uh, this year should be a really good one. So. It's hard not to be optimistic when you enjoy something so much, right? I mean, like even yeah, in years of true. bad hatches, you still look forward to it and still power through it, even uh, even though it can be tough sometimes because you just enjoy it. it is, and you know what? Honestly, you joke about, oh, it was great dog work. That is what it is. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what makes it so much, so much fun a lot of times is just getting out there and hunting. And I like – one of the reasons I like pheasant hunting so much or Sharpie or anything like that is I'm walking into places that – the majority of people on the planet have probably never walked into, you know, or, or watching the dog work a thicket back in the backside of a piece or on a huge public land piece where you just know it's just wild country, right? Like you're getting out into, into some cool places and you're doing it with, you know, with your buddies and your, your favorite four legged friends. And, um, it's always great. It's always great pulling the trigger, but it's fun nonetheless. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I've been chasing after birds with a dang cap gun here for the last, you know, few months and all the spring so i get it but yeah i mean like to go out on the prairies of of montana or wherever south dakota nebraska kansas doing whatever it's fun with especially like sharpies sage grouse prairie chickens is like when you're walking that landscape to think that they've been out there for thousands of years already so that's kind of cool yeah, absolutely. Well, and I know getting ready for that, especially if you're going to take a trip somewhere, Onyx is real helpful. And when Corey Loeffler and I went and did a, a turkey trip this spring down to, we went down to Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska, and we, we went into Nebraska completely blind, you know, didn't really know where we were going, didn't really have any tips from anybody. We just literally pulled up on X and looked for, for big chunks of woods, mostly in public land, big, big chunks of public land, things like that. Obviously, we knocked on some doors, so we used some ownership names. But um, Corey turned on the tree species identification, and that really helped us kind of narrow down some of those big, uh, you know, patches of, of uh trees where we yeah. would, where we would find turkeys that's that's kind of it you know when you think about that okay onyx has this tree identification tool that's pretty cool and when you put it into practice it's like holy smokes like this is this is awesome yeah i mean it's it's kind of bringing all those things together right you've got your your satellite maps land ownership 
Um, you've got your tree data and then you bring in crop data as well. Mm -hmm. And it's everything you throw that all together. And, and I mean, you're just super deadly, right? Like there's, you've got everything you need to hunt whatever species, wherever you want to go. Um, it's just a matter of, of kind of putting all those pieces together and, and going and doing it. So, you know, with, with the internet nowadays, you can kind of learn just about anything and you throw on X on top of that. And I mean, I feel confident going and doing whatever. So hey, who's, who's, whose waypoints are you showing on the screen right there, Dan? Those better not be my way. We get those off of there. Showing, <laughs> showing everybody. Our they're, all, they're all mine, but <laughs> all if you can find them, you can have them, I guess. Screenshot that. Good yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you know, and for guys going out to North Dakota right now, having that crop, ident that crop layer tool, that crop identification, I mean, that's kind of invaluable. Between that and the e-posting, being able to look on Onyx and see who's got stuff e-posted, uh, I guarantee you just about everybody going into North Dakota here for the early Canada goose season is going to be using that stuff. Yeah, you got to have it. And we just updated it, I think. Uh, it's It's been updated for 2022 now. And if you, you know, be sure to look at it again this year because – it is pretty drastically different um, year over year. There's a significantly more electronically posted land. So, I mean, you zoom into uh, any of the areas, it'd be interesting to look at it year over year because, um, you know, it's people have started to hear, hear about it and uh, they've added significantly more, which is kind of nice because then you kind of know what you, you know, know what you've got going into it. So, but definitely a layer you're going to want to use. You know, and obviously you're going to be looking for wheat fields, uh, you know, or even like a oat field or hay field or something like mm -hmm. that. But everything is going to be a little late this year, I think. So if guys are going over to North Dakota, um, I'd be looking for, honestly, I'd be looking for water probably first on Onyx and then looking for some of those some of those crop fields around there. But it's hard to say. I mean, if you're further south in the state, I think uh, some of that stuff will be coming off. But if you're if you're if you're going to be in the northern part of North Dakota, there might be a lot of crops still standing when you get over there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of what I like to do starting out is just find, you know, big main bodies of water that you're going to have roosting areas on. And then you can flip on um, that crop crop data layer you go into layer settings uh and then you can go and select uh, wheat so it's a u.s crop distribution folder go into layer settings and you can go flip on like wheat for example and what i like to why i like to do that is because then you at least know what areas of the state they're planting wheat more heavily oh, you sure. know a lot of those areas down south especially uh with the price of corn and beans right now um, not a lot of wheat. There, there's not a lot of wheat. So mm -hmm. it just kind of gives you a better understanding of where that wheat's going to be. If you want to go hunt them in the field, um, you might look at a different part of the state that has water in it as well. So um, just using that to kind of piece together where you want to. You know, that's, scout, so. that's a good point. You know, uh, especially down where we're at here, down in that kind of that central slash Southern part of Minnesota and the Western part of the state, there's no wheat really around us. Mm -hmm. So the further, the further South you go, there's going to be less and less wheat and the further North you go, you're going to find more wheat, but there's going to be less harvest yeah. taking place. So it's, it could be a struggle for some of those guys over there this year. Yeah. I mean, kind of what I've found for, for with an August, early August opener is that um, either you're going to find those fields that have feeds of, you know, anywhere from, you know, a family group, 15, 10, 15 birds. Um, but if you put in the time, like we have found some great opening day spots that have, you know, uh, six, 800 birds in them even. So it's just a matter of putting on the miles in early season and just finding that, that right spot. So, um, but in saying that, you know, uh, a lot of years we've hunted early season feeds that have been, you know, 100, 150 birds and, and done well on Smashed. it. Smashed, so. yeah. It, you know, it, th that scouting and the putting the windshield time in is the name of the game, no matter what, for, for well, for a lot of things, but particularly for waterfowl. And we've had, we had one hunt, the four of us in early season in North Dakota, where we shot, it was a 15 per 15 bird per guy limit. And we shot our 60 birds and it was, 
it was madness. Like it was unreal. Four <laughs> guys shooting 60 geese it was insane. That feed was probably about 400 birds, but I know in the lean years, there, there's been times where we have just struggled and we'll see, yeah, 25 birds out there and we'll all look at each other like, Hmm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Is, is, this, is this gonna be worth it? I mean, we could, they could come in in two groups and if it's a, you know, you got enough guns going off, you're going to put up a stack, but you know, do we, do we sleep in tomorrow or do we try to set yeah. up on 25 geese? And that's, that's yeah. early season goose hunting. Yeah. I think it was, gosh, probably the best example of that is I think it was 2000 fall of 2012. Um, and I think I put on just myself, I think I put on 17 or 1800 miles the week oh, before man. the season. And I think there were three of us doing that. And I think that it was the last day before opener and we found a field where we shot a, uh, I think it was a 10 man limit. I can't remember if it was 15 birds or 10 birds at the time, but um, yeah, for early season, the name of the game is just get in the right area and unfortunately spend $4 gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of gas, some bug spray probably or thermocells. Uh, I know yeah. last time we did it, we spent one afternoon just swimming. We went to a nearby lake and, and swam because it was like 90 degrees. And But uh, it can be a lot of fun and it, it's that first crack at waterfall season. But mm -hmm. it can be tough. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah, and then like you were saying earlier, loafing ponds. Like if you can find good cattle pond areas, again, I don't. I'm not advocating for shooting roosts at all. Right. Yeah, I don't want to do that. But if you can find a good day loafing, midday loafing spot, um, those are always just some fun hunts. Watching them suck into to water. Oh, what? <laughs> I know. I don't want to bust roosts either. But man, shooting geese over water, <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's fun and sometimes very easy. So, yeah. wow. but. I've tried it a few times in the, the nice thing about in the evening, you know, when you get real desperate, I've tried like at the end of the season. And the nice thing is they come in generally after sunset. So you don't have to worry <laughs> about shooting too many of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so I've been there, done that, but I'm not advocating for it. Of course not. Uh, yeah. You bet. Well, what, what else is new with on X? What's going on right now? We're just in the thick of it, man. Just getting ready, getting everything rolling for the season here. We've got a, a few new cool things. Um, kind of one of the things I'm most excited for, uh, if you look under the, the Minnesota folder, uh, we've added a bunch of new timber harvest data for you grouse cool. hunters. Nice. So that spans county land, state land, et cetera. So it's not just uh, strictly on like forest service or, or federal land anymore. And that's going to be uh, – that's going to be a wicked tool. It's labeled in terms of when, what year it was harvested. I think it's called forest disturbance. So um, that one's going to be really sweet. Super looking forward to using that one. Um, so that that's a layer that you can put on and uh, particularly uh, for Northern Minnesota hunters, I'd assume yeah. Um, yeah. that that's going to show you some areas that have been logged. Yeah. So if you go, if you go scroll in pretty much anywhere, there's public up North, um, there's going to be a significant significantly more timber harvest so you know that tan land is county land uh i would assume you're going to find some if you keep scrolling in further um just pick a piece of property and you'll start to see it they'll still pop up here um yeah so so they're labeled in terms of what year they were harvested so you've just got a lot of ammo you can they're kind of a tan outlined and you zoom in and it'll tell you what year it was harvested. So um, that just helps you pinpoint exactly with these giant tracts of public land uh, where exactly to find birds. So um, it, that's, that's something that I used last year and it was pretty, pretty good. So I'm excited for, for other, everyone else to have a crack at using it as well. Yeah. You know, and that's something uh, I had a discussion with some other people off the air today as a matter of fact about disturbance and logging and uh, the timber industry and what what that does for wildlife like obviously guys like us and probably most people watching this right now probably understand the benefits of of you know some disturbance in the forest uh like logging and what that can do for wildlife out there but I, there's so many people that don't understand how taking some trees out, taking some of that old growth out and letting some new growth come in, how beneficial that is, not just for the health of the forest, but for the health of the wildlife that's in there as well. 
Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, old growth forests, I mean, honestly, they don't support that much wildlife. When you look at, uh, you know, more of an early successional piece is going to have a lot more biodiversity. Um, and again, it, it you got to have that that uh, successional driver, right? Whether it's logging, um, you know, we've done a damn good job of fire suppression, unfortunately. So mm-hmm. that historically was a great successional driver. And, you know, we just for, you know, what it is, what it is, but people hate fire. Yeah. Um, so logging is a great, great tool we have to help regenerate those forests. Well, it's interesting. We, we were up in Saskatchewan and in the last couple of years up there, lots and lots of wildfires around where we've been. And we had to fly around a couple of them, which is, it's pretty wild being in a, in a float plane and going, ah, we just got to fly around this wildfire. No big deal. You know, which, and it, it never is there, you know, we're just going around them, but seeing it from the air is, uh, is a pretty wicked experience. But most of the time up there, they, they let them burn out. Um, as long as there's no you know, people or structures or yeah. something uh, important to, to save, they'll just let them burn out because it, it is just generating regrowth there in the forest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a very important tool for, for, sure. for all sorts of different wildlife, whether it's, you know, elk out west or birds, deer, everything in here. So, yeah. Um, another cool thing we've got coming out, uh, you were talking about Canada. So we have added Canadian maps. We've got oh, public really? land. Um, we don't have private land ownership data there. The Mounties are a little bit of a stickler. But uh, we've got all the crown land up there. So interesting. Kind of kind of just getting uh, starting to get dialed a little bit on Canada. So if you're planning on going up there, you can see all that, that public land this year. So that's exciting. Yeah, we'll check that out. We're we're heading up there here for a few weeks, so we'll mm-hmm. definitely uh, give her a heck up there. And there's so much crown land up in uh, up in Canada. Actually, it's it's kind of amazing how much public land they have up there, and just how it's a little bit different than the way it works in the United States. But it's uh, it'll be interesting to know what is what when we go up there. All right, Ben. Well, if people want to get themselves an Onyx membership or maybe upgrade their membership. What should they do? Go head over to onyxmaps.com or onyxhunt.com and uh, you can check out premium as single state elite as all 50 states plus there is an absolute slew of, uh, of benefits you get by being an elite member, um, discounts on, on a lot of great brands, um, early access to a lot of great brands as well as uh, you get access to things like Top Rod, Hunt and Fool, Deer Cast, so a lot of bang for your hundred bucks for that membership. Yeah, a lot of tools, not just not just your your all the things that Onyx can benefit you for, but a lot of other tools as well to make you more successful this fall. Ben Bredigan, uh, thanks for the time today on the show. Good luck in Montana. All right, good luck up in the Northland. We'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks, Ben. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. Well, summer's not over yet, so you can still plan a fishing trip to northern Minnesota and get in on some of the the action up at Lake of the Woods. And man, after seeing what came out of that tournament up there recently, it looks like now's the time to be up there. And Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism joins us now to talk about it. Joe, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, but hey. Tell me there aren't some big walleyes swimming around Lake of the Woods, hey? That picture of the 34-incher with a 28-inch walleye in the same photo, I mean, they, it's crazy how big that fish was. Well, and I, I want to I wanna make it clear that we're talking about a 34-inch walleye, not a pike, not, not, not a sturgeon, a 34-inch walleye. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, for those of you that are watching this video, I mean, and, and for those who maybe you're listening uh, uh, only, I'll tell you what, the 34-incher absolutely dwarfed a 28-inch walleye. That fish was not only long, but it was beefy. And, yes, the angler that caught it was fishing with uh, pro Mike Olson of Fish Addictions, but uh, he did keep it to uh, to mount it. And that is a 34-inch walleye is a big walleye, very rare fish. 
That was that was in the tournament that he caught that. That was no that well, that was in a I think it was in a either pre fishing or in a dealer tournament the small tournament because you know Warrior Warrior Boats was up you know, this last Saturday and they had their David A Anderson Memorial fishing tournament you know David Anderson was a very uh, instrumental angler um, and just all around great guy with Warrior Boats and they honor him. Um, and his legacy with this tournament, of course, and this is a seventh annual. They had 144 warrior boats, teams of two people that fished the tournament on uh, on Saturday. And uh, I'll tell you what, the winning bag came in from uh, actually a couple of friends of mine. Uh, big congrats to Nate Gilkey and Dan Pfeiffer. Uh, those guys came in with five walleyes for, what was the amount? Almost a 10 pound average, 49.37 pounds, almost Man. a 10 pound average. Now, there is a little bit of slop when they, you know, catch and release. So it's, they go by inches and they convert the inches, mm. you know, over to pounds. So they're they're a little gracious that way, I would say, with pounds. But still, m- monster weights. I mean, these fish were big. You know, they, uh, they're, they're five fish. Heck, I think the smallest fish was over 27 inches on their card. So they really did a nice, nice job. And uh, um, just, uh, again, a lot of big fish caught in this tournament. Yeah, even with a, a length to weight conversion, you still have to have pretty long fish to get those weights. So if you're talking about nearly a 10-pound average, I mean, you got to be talking about fish that are, yeah, that upper 20, close to 30 inches, maybe over 30. And going back to that 34, you know, Joe, that 30-incher is always kind of a benchmark for trophy walleye. And then when you start talking in like, gosh, I'd love to catch a 31, maybe a 32. But when you hear about a 34-incher, like, I, I've only heard of a, a couple of them being caught in Minnesota. You almost have to go to, you know, some sort of re- remote destination, some walleye, you know, Tobin Lake or Columbia River or some sort of some sort of destination. Well, obviously, Lake of the Woods is a pretty big walleye destination, so I'm not surprised that there was one caught there. But that's a, like that's rare. Like, I don't know if people realize how rare the walleye guys will know, but like that's a rare fish. Well, and you know, even to your point, you know, you you in the outdoor industry, you're speaking of a trophy walleye being 30 plus. You know, I know a lot of people in a lot of circles, 28 plus is a trophy walleye. Sure. And then you're you're talking 30 plus, and now you know you're talking 34. I mean, that is a freak of a fish. And you know, a lot of times when you catch a fish like that, they might have that real big head with a dilapidated body. This is all fish. I mean, this was a just a good, solid, dark, healthy walleye. You know, and. Uh, uh, just a, I mean, look at the head in that thing. Look at the mean look on that fish's mm-hmm. face. See that? I love you that. You talk about a cool looking fish. I mean, that just, and you know, a lot of times when you get those really big walleyes, they've lived a long life. So mm-hmm. they will be beat up. You know, their tails will be beat up. The size, this is like a perfect walleye. You know, you notice there's a little bit of, on his dorsal fin, there's a little bit of a cut on his dorsal fin. But other than that, it's really a nice looking fish, which is just amazing. I love it when the when <clears throat> you know you get into a bigger walleye when they got those humps the shoulders up on when yeah. the backs you know tower over their nose you know just a little bit and then you can even see a little belly sag on that fish you know it, it, it's almost like a like a one of those rainy river fish when they go and, and catch one of those big heavy duty ones in the in the rainy it almost has that belly start that belly sag like it, it's a thick fish it's a nice and and you and I've seen. 30 inches that are skinny like even that that 28 is a nice fish but you could tell it's not you know it's not one yeah. of those big rainy river fish it's a nice fish it's nice and long and that's i think why length tends to be more uh respected than than weight nowadays but uh seeing one with that's a little tall like that that's a nice fish it would have been interesting to weigh that fish and I don't, I don't think it was weighed it would be very interesting to weigh that 34 inch you know what how much would that fish weigh and uh you know, I tell you, it's, uh, we don't, you know, I tell you what's interesting too. Last week, there was also a 21 and a half inch smallmouth caught on the Rainy River. Oh, damn. You know, that, that fish was caught on Lake of the Woods, a big walleye, but the, that 21 and a half inch smallie was caught in. Now, that fish is beat up. Look at the bottom of that tail. You know, the bottom of the tail is almost missing. And of course, I'm envisioning a big pike trying to grab it and, you know, mm-hmm. who knows what happened to it. But 
That is a monster small, and that's getting close to the state record smallmouth, 21. I think the state record's 22-something, inch-wise, you know, but, uh, and who knows what this way, but it's, again, a solid fish, and, I mean, there, there's some big fish floating around Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River, you guys. Wow, we knew that. I mean, that's no, <laughs> that's, a wise man once said, if you want to catch big fish, you got to go where the big fish are, and I think he was talking about Lake of the Woods. It might have been you, even, Joe Henry. Yeah, you know, I tell my buddies that when I, when I kid around with them, I'm like, yeah, you know what the secret of catching those big walleyes are? Fish in the body of water has a lot of big walleyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Do you know, um, going back to the the Warrior Tournament, do you know how guys were catching those fish? You know, I, I know, um, I do know that they were fishing all three ways. You know, uh, normally in the dog days of August, you'd be pulling crankbaits on lead core or downriggers, and you'd be pulling spinners. Well, this year, um, it's a little bit different, you know, maybe with the high water we've had, maybe with a little bit cooler temps uh, early on. But, you know, um, jigging is still in play. There is still a lot of fish being caught jigging. So I do know fish were caught all three ways. And I don't know how that specific. I actually do. I'm pretty sure that I think that fish was caught on a crankbait, probably pulling a lead core, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I can't verify that for sure. I talked to a few guys that were up at Lake of the Woods last week, uh, some friends of mine. And they're like, yeah, we, we only went out like seven, eight miles and we caught, oh, we caught a 27 and a 24 and a 25. And then we talked to some other guys who went out like 28 miles and they caught a lot of big fish. I'm like, wait a minute, are you complaining about catching (laughs) 25s and 27s? I mean, you get so spoiled up there, Joe, that, you know, they, they caught some really nice fish, but they were, you know, in their head, they're like, gosh, should we have gone further out to catch fish? But you can go. And I, and I said, well, last time I fished up there, we only went about two miles and caught 29s and 30s and 28s. And obviously fish are moving around a little bit. It depends on time of year and, and weather and things like that. But you don't always have to go far to catch big fish. You you do not have to go far to catch big fish, especially this year. Those fish are more adjacent to shore than ever. And, you know, normally this time of year, you know, a lot of those big headed fish, those I say big headed, big walleyes, you know, they're uh, they're out in that basin because that's where the tulabies live. And on Lake of the Woods, when a walleye becomes um, about 25 inches long, about five pounds, that's when they really start shifting their diet to tulabies. Not that they won't eat other things, but, you know, the DNR will tell you, Brett, that when you got a, a lake or a river in Minnesota that has big walleyes and big pike, very good chance it has a tulabi population. It's all part of the equation. And uh, Lake of the Woods is no different. You know, the one thing I want to I wanna remember, now let's remember this conversation we're having because people are going out and they're showing – limits of walleyes on Lake of the Woods over and over. They're catching these big fish. They're complaining about catching so many slots that they have to let go and all that stuff. Where were these fish in February when everybody said the lake was in trouble? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in February, you know, auction levels get a little lower. You have a lot of traffic on the ice. You're getting out far, farther, uh, far enough on Lake of the Woods that some of those walleyes keep on going into no man's land to get away from the traffic. Some of those walleyes double back and we'll be sitting in 22, 23, 24 feet of water where there's hardly any fish houses now because they're all further out. Um, uh, you know, some of them probably going to Canada. I mean, you got so many things going on. You got the ecosystem. Some sometimes those fish are suspending, and, and most anglers are fishing below them. I mean, you got so much going on. Uh, you know, the DNR tells us the lake is healthy. We believe the lake is healthy, and this time of year, everybody's like, "Oh my lord, our fish is yeah. good." Yeah, oh my god, <laughs> limit, after limit after limit. What about what about February? What changed since February? Did those fish grow to you know uh, eighteen to thirty four inches uh, overnight? I mean, come on. Well, I, I suppose if you think about it, you've got in the summertime you've got boats, and yeah, you'll have pockets of boats, pockets of boats, but they're doing this and going over here. Whereas in the winter, you got a thousand people right here, and a thousand people right here, and a thousand people right here, and they might be moving around a little bit but you're probably concentrating a lot of people in one area day after day after day. And you're going to push those fish around when you do that. Well, how about, how about, uh, you know, you, you got to get out to your fish house uh, somehow. So you're either driving on an ice road that's causing noise. You're taking a snowmobile, you're taking a track rig. I mean, all those things cause noise and push fish. In fact, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, another lake to the south of us, a very good fishing lake, Upper Red, you know, it's the same kind of thing that, you know, Upper Red notoriously is better, um, you know, earlier than it is later. And part of that might be because those fish are kind of getting pushed out to that boundary and eventually they go past that boundary. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say for sure I'm not a biologist, but, you know, I, it certainly happens at Lake of the Woods. We keep pushing those fish further and further out. And that's why we go further out as the day, as the uh, season goes on. And then at some point in time, you'll start hearing reports where, uh, 
so-and-so doubled back and was fishing 23 feet of water, and he's doing really good. Yeah. Well, I, I remember hearing that last year, as a matter of fact. That exact yep. scenario played out. All right, Joe, well, if people want to start planning a winter trip up there or get in on this uh, summer fishing, maybe plan a, a fall fall trip or fall cast and blast, something like that, where should they go for more info? Yeah, you know what? Uh, check out our website. It has everything you need. That is Lake of the Woods, MN. Com. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Did you know there are more than 1,000 lakes in Ottertail County? Yep, and I'm gonna fish as many as I can. I'm an outdoorsy otter. Nothing beats a full day of fishing for me. The lakes of Ottertail County give me plenty of options to lower my boat and snag the perfect catch. Not an outdoorsy otter? No problem. Ottertail County has something for everyone. You just need to find your inner otter. To find your inner otter, go to ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, once again, time to head up to Otter Tail Lakes Country, check in with Eric Osberg right now. Eric, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, not so bad. Not so bad. Got to do a little bit of fishing uh, recently, which was nice because I had to uh, had to scratch that itch. After after being down in Florida and fishing down there, we, we didn't really get a chance to fish around home much, so it was nice to get out a little bit. And I see you've been out fishing a little bit as well. We've, we've been getting out. It... Um it, it, again, we were, I, I don't want to say, well, we're in the dog days of summer, right? Like this is, it's different. You know, we had a insanely good walleye bite this spring and, and, you know, word on the street is tough. Uh, fishing is kind of tough all the way around. And I don't know if it's because there's so much bait in the systems or I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is, but you know, uh, the, the few folks that I've ter- talked to fishing has been tough. There was a, a youth angling tournament on, on uh, Little Pine Lake last weekend, and those folks did good. Uh, there was a walleye tournament, so there's there's fish to be caught. You just maybe have to pr- approach things a little bit differently to get them in a boat. Yeah, and our, our water levels are still pretty low. I mean, we got a couple of inches of rain in the last week or so, so that's helped bring some water levels up. But some of the places we like to fish, it's just like you look at it, and it's like, man, it just doesn't look the same, and fish are in different spots right now. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of it can be kind of a tough time of year right now. It can. And, and, and we've, you know, so we're, we're, you know, Willie and I are doing a lot of bass fishing lately. Um, and, uh, we've, I'm not saying we're not catching bass, but it, it's been, there's, okay. So there's, there's, there's the, there's the, the, the one good one that we got. And, and there is a little bit of a story behind that. So, um, that's a 19 and a half inch of smallmouth. And, and we're on, we're on a lake that we catch a lot of fish on um mostly year round and so i was we were we were we were looking out on reefs right so this lake has reefs and we we we, i knew there was a reef in those spot but we've never really fished it that much and so we went over to the reef and all of a sudden the reef was a lot bigger than i realized Mm. and and so we, we 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 fished the reef and I had a huge smallmouth up to the boat, and I lost it. And then we caught a largemouth. But we marked enough fish where we were like, okay, well, let's go. Let's let's get the underwater camera. Um, and so we got the underwater camera, and we went back out to that reef. And sure enough, we saw a bunch of sm- we saw a bunch of perch, we saw a bunch of bluegills, and we saw a bunch of smallmouth bass. We saw some walleyes. So we okay. So we have this new reef that we haven't fished much. We, we've visually confirmed with an underwater camera what they are. They're the fish we want. And so we tried, you know, Ned rigs. We tried hair jigs. We tried wacky rigs. We tried pulling cranks over it. We tried everything we could think of. And I'm like, you know what? The answer is probably a slip bobber. Hmm. You know, the reef tops out at like 23, 24 feet. I'm like, let's just tie up some slip bobbers and we'll put a half a crawler on there. And we'll just toss it out and we'll just sit there. And, um, and so we did that. And, and, and it, it, uh, at first it was bluegill, 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 which was okay because they were decent bluegills. 
but then um, we we had, we were fishing during the day, and and we're like, okay, well, we're gonna stop at noon, and we had just gotten out there not long ago, and by the time I got all rigged up, it was probably eleven fifteen, so we had like a forty five minute window, and right before noon, Bobber went down, and that was a nineteen and a half inch smallmouth, and now we haven't mm-hmm. we haven't gone back. There you go. We haven't gone back to verify that, you know, it could have been a, you know, a blind squirrel finding a nut, right? But <laughs> But now at least we, now at least we have a, um, a game plan of how to of how to of how to fish that reef. And so, uh, you know, the moral of the story is, if if all else fails, don't be afraid to to throw on a slip bobber. You know, and even if you're not fishing a deep reef, you could be fishing weeds, you could be fishing a bath off, you could be fishing whatever. Don't be afraid to throw on a uh, slip bobber and a collar or a leech, and uh, give that a try. Yeah, so you're using. Were you? Did you say you're using a crawler then, mostly? We were using a crawler. Yep, yep. So it was just a a, a small one sixteenth ounce jig with a, and I was taking a half a crawler and just kind of t boning it. You know what I mean? Like just hooking it right in the middle of the of the worm. So the idea is that hopefully that worm is. I gotta move my hand, so you know, hopefully that worm is 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 like that in the water. Um, yeah, and then just a, a short leader with a swivel, and then and then a, we put a little split shot above the above the swivel. I mean, short leader. When I say short, I mean five six feet. And then a, a tiny split shot above the swivel, and then a, a slip bobber above that. And and um, it, you know, believe it or not, it, I mean, yes, you're fishing a small er, you know a small area at a time, but you can move around. You can have the you know at one point. You know, we were, we, you know, Willie was running the underwater camera and he's like, there's smallmouth here. But, and then, but we weren't getting bit. And I'm like, well, should we move? And yep. So then we were just kind of using a troll motor and, you know, the bobbers were just kind of dragging behind us. And then he's like, oh, there's a smallmouth. I hit spot lock. And then the bobbers kind of reposition themselves behind the boat. So, I mean, you don't have to sit in one spot the entire time. And of course, you can cast the bobbers up into the wind and let them drift across the reef. Um, but you know, I guess for us personally, it was, it was, it was just cool to see a plan work again. It was only one fish. We haven't, we haven't figured out, I wouldn't say a pattern, but we, you know, we found a new piece of structure to fish and we found a different way to fish it. And at least up until this point, it's, it's put the the right fish in the boat. Were you trying to stay up on top of it or were you fishing off the edges or how big of a drop off was it? it's pretty gradual. It's not a very, you know, so the deep water, but you know, the deep water around the reef is like 35 to 33 feet. And then it just kind of comes up and, and, and goes into, um, you know, 24, 23 feet is where it tops off. But again, there's a lot of bait in the systems right now, at least in our systems. Um, you know, you know, you're dry. You've seen this on a sonar system where, you know, that big cloud of, of stuff comes through. Well, we tell ourselves, well, that's a that's a cloud of bait. Mm-hmm. Well, with the with the under uh, what the underwater camera allows you to do is just verify all that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. one of the first times we drop the camera down, we're like, there's a huge school of perch, like nice little edible perch. So it's no wonder that these fish aren't attacking our plastics or aren't attacking our, you know, artificial lures, is because they've got all the food they want right in front of them. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> having an underwater kids, um, even and, and even if you know, even just to garner more information, it, it helps, right? Like there's another there's another reef on this lake, and we've marked a ton of fish, and so you drop the underwater camera, and there's a dozen suckers sitting on top of these rocks, right? Like it, it looks like perfect walleye habitat. It looks like perfect bass, you know, smallmouth habitat, anyways. And you get excited when you see these marks, and then you drop down the underwater camera. And you're like, oh, that's a school of suckers just hanging out the rock. <laughs> oh, I've done that. <laughs> yeah, and so, and yeah. so you know, I know that electro- you know, electronics are becoming more and more sophisticated, right? Forward-looking, side-looking, live this and whatever. But th- there's still some interpretation required there, right? Like you have to be like, you know, even if it's a live feedback of a fish, now some fish are obvious, right? Like that's a muskie. And, and you, if they get fine-tuned enough, you can be like, that's a bass, that's a walleye. But there's, 
you know, we use the underwater camera a lot in the winter, but I, I, I think, you know, having it with you in the summer, if you have one, is a really good idea. And yeah, it's a little bit harder to see. And I just throw, I just give Willie the camera and I throw a towel over him so there's no glare. Oh, yeah. And then he just, he just tells me what he sees. And if we think it's, you know, think it's worth fishing. The other thing that it does is it tells you, and again, you can interpret this with your electronics, but it tells you exactly what the bottom is like, right? Like these are a lot of rocks or this is a little bit of gravel with a little bit of rocks. And over here's a transit, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so, I, you know, I, I, you know, a good underwater, you can get a good underwater camera for five or 600 bucks. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it it's not going to tell you what is 45 feet that way or 50 feet that way. But, but, you can draw exactly what it is that you're sitting on top of, and, um, and you can try to take advantage. Yeah, and I've definitely done that in the winter many times to see why why aren't these fish biting? Well, what are they? And then we drop down, and it's a you know a school of sheephead, or they were bluegills, and we were hoping they were crappies. So then we had to downsize or change our presentation. Camera helps, and then we did use an aqua view up at uh, up in Saskatchewan this year at Tazan in a hundred feet of water just to kind of see what the bottom looked like. And that's that's pretty wild when you can drop a camera down to a hundred feet and see what the bottom structure looks like down there, and see then you can kind of compare it to your graph and be like. Okay, okay, that's what I'm seeing yep. on there right now. It's uh, it's a useful tool for sure. All right, Eric, and if people want to spend some more time in Otter Tail Lakes Country uh, the rest of the summer, maybe plan some fall or winter activities up there, what should they do? They can find their inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.